Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Chapman. I'm the Small Business Commissioner, and thank you for attending our Contract Law for Small Business uh, session this afternoon. Just a few uh, housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, please be aware my staff and I will be taking photos during the event uh, for use in our promotional material and social media. If you don't want to be photographed, please let Roseanne and myself know and we'll respect your wishes. Facilities located down the foyer. On the left, men's first and women's further down. Uh, we acknowledge the land that we meet on today is the traditional lands for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people who may be attending from other areas of South Australia and are present here today. Welcome to all our viewers on the webinar today. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions later, as indeed uh, will our audience here. In the event of an emergency, please stay calm, take instructions from Roseanne and myself. The emergency exit is straight out the door and across the, uh, the hallway there and down the stairs. The evacuation meeting point is Hindmarsh Square, but we'll uh, make sure uh, everyone gets there safely. If anyone needs to leave the building, uh, please let Roseanne know and we'll just cross you off the list. Welcome to Stephen Polichonen from Belperia Clark Lloyds today. And uh, Stephen will be giving uh, you the overview in terms of contract law and some of the issues that arise there. I'll just give you a bit of a rundown in terms of uh, our office and what we do. That's our shop front downstairs. Uh, please feel free to pop in at any time and uh, have a look at the information that we've got on a whole range of government services um, across uh, the, the vast range of government. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Roseanne. Um, Literally, we are here to help small business. So if you have any issues or want to know how government might be able to assist you in a whole range of areas, we are here to provide a first stop shop across government and point you in the right direction. Our main uh, area is alternative dispute resolution. So sorting out disputes between businesses and other businesses, local government and indeed state government. Um, so we deal with about 3,400 inquiries. Last year, a little over 280 uh, went to formal cases that we worked with the parties <coughs> to try and uh, get to an outcome that everyone could li live with. So we can take that through to a formal mediation. We've got a panel of nine mediators uh, that uh, we can bring in to assist if the dispute gets to that stage. And that's the only time when there's a cost and it's $195 per party per day. However, if your dispute's in the retail and commercial lease area, and we need to bring in a mediator for that, um, if it's a landlord tenant issue, uh, there is no cost under uh, that particular act. So um, please feel free if it's a rental issue um, to have a discussion with our office because about half of our uh, cases actually involve retail and commercial lease issues. My role is created under the Small Business Commissioner Act. Uh, it gives me power to actually seek information when we're trying to resolve disputes. Uh, but sitting underneath and on the sides of the Fair Trading Act, and we have five uh, codes covering farming, news agency, motor vehicle, um, uh, franchising, and also building and construction. And those industry codes give me much greater powers um, in terms of alternative dispute resolution, including the power to get people to come in and answer questions, uh, take part in the mediation. And sometimes we actually do need to activate the codes as we term it to get people to the table. And usually it's big business um, that uh, doesn't want to play nicely with our office. Uh, when I have activated the codes generally, uh, they come to the table pretty quickly because there are penalties if they don't. We've got two new um, policy initiatives from the uh, following the change of government, farm debt mediation. Uh, that legislation has passed the parliament. It will be proclaimed on Thursday and be in operation from the 3rd of September. So we've been doing a lot of work to get all the paperwork and processes in order uh, for that. So that's a pretty big initiative for the farming community that we will have 
a process which the banks must follow before they foreclose uh, on primary producers. The second area that we are currently working on and we're consulting in relation to it, another code under the Fair Trading Act is assisting primary producers when mining companies or resource companies are seeking access to their land. And again, it's designed to be an alternative uh, dispute resolution process. We currently have the code out for consultation with key stakeholders and uh, we'll await that feedback before uh, the, the Minister for Industry and Skills, the Honourable David Persone, considers that and takes it through its uh, last processes. I've also got a range of responsibilities. I mentioned retail and commercial leases. Uh, we have a number of changes um, that we are considering in relation to that Act, most of which were put forward to the Parliament last year, uh, but didn't get through the other <coughs> House before the election. So we'll be looking to reintroduce those, or I'll be recommending to the government that they do that, plus a, a number of other um, minor additions, and we're just consulting with a number of people on those. Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Act is an adjudication process aimed very much at those in the building industry. It's designed to get payments flowing through, particularly the subcontractors and suppliers, quickly. Um, and again, that, that act has been subject not only to a state review, but also a national review. And the national review was released in May, some 86 recommendations which we are working our way through. Uh, I'd have to say a lot of which I agree with. Uh, there's a few that I don't necessarily agree with, but ultimately it will be the government's decision as to which of those recommendations they accept. Late payment of government debts. Um, again, there's further change happening. Uh, this legislation is back in the parliament. It's designed to ensure the businesses get paid by government. Now, one would think that would be part of the course, but unfortunately we have to have an act uh, that ensures that occurs. My role sits there as a uh, dispute resolution and uh, <coughs> ultimately under the current act I have the power to determine a penalty on the agency uh, in terms of interest um, subject to the business fulfilling certain criteria. Um, the government is certainly, the new government has made it clear that they, they want a faster process and there will be a penalty automatically applied if the account remains unpaid for 60 days. I'd like to see that back at 30, but some I win and some I don't. Um, that's still going through the parliament at the moment, but the intent is government should be at the forefront of paying its bills on time. And if you have a problem, please don't hesitate to contact my office. Local Government Act responsibilities there under uh, for mobile food vendors and disputes that may arise between a mobile food vendor and indeed um, another food vendor uh, or the council. Each council is required to have what they term uh, location rules and publish those and that determines where food trucks as they're more commonly known can go. Uh, my role is to work through issues if they arise in terms of a dispute in that. Work Health and Safety Act, the codes of practice, so if you're Let's say in the building industry, there will be a code of practice that governs how workers should be working when they're at heights, for example. Um, that area is normally pretty quiet. My role is to provide advice through to the Minister for Industrial Relations on any new codes. Uh, currently, I've got a lot of paper about that thick because they've reviewed existing codes, which have come to me with a number of changes, a lot of very technical, and uh, we're working our way through those. Information on the uh, government uh, services that are available, business.sa.gov.au. <coughs> Small Business Friendly Council initiatives, initiative that uh, we started in August of last year, and I'm pleased to say we're up to 26 councils statewide, uh, including the City of Adelaide has signed on to that. And this is designed to bring councils closer to their small business community, communities and look at issues of how do they pay their bills in terms of time, and the charter that we've put forward, for example, says 30 days. Um, we signed up Port Lincoln Council the other day. They pay their bills in 14 days. So they're a mile in front. Um, they're an exemplar. So basically, how do councils engage with their local businesses? This program encourages them to do that and establish a group if one doesn't exist. A lot of local chambers of commerce or business associations are in existence. Some aren't. And we're trying to build the links 
between businesses and indeed local government. Phone call away, email away. Uh, please like us on Facebook because we can keep you up to date in uh, terms of what is happening uh, in the small business area. Okay, contract law for small business. Huge area in terms of uh, the challenges that arise, not only I've talked about Retail and Commercial Lease Act, but indeed a whole range of areas. Um, unfortunately, we cannot provide legal advice, so we always recommend that if you are faced with a significant contract, that you do take independent advice. Um, particularly in the building industry, for example, that I deal with, um, I ask people when they've got themselves into a bit of trouble, did you get a did you have a lawyer look at this contract before um, you signed up to it? And the answer more often than not is no. And I get the excuse, oh, it's too expensive. Well, I take a different view. Yes, lawyers um, aren't often cheap, but it can be cheaper than losing your house um, and losing your business. Now, particularly with some of the building contracts I see, the issue of liquidated damages and the risk that's been spread down through the chain to uh, the people at the lower end are quite substantial. So we always encourage people to take independent advice and seek legal advice on contracts. There are many, many issues that arise and it's often the clauses that are hidden uh, at 352 part C2A on page 122 that can often have the big impact. Now, um, contracts have become more complex and that's why we're having today's session in terms of contract law. It's a, a tasting session. And our guest speaker, Stephen, has spent 10 years working uh, in private companies across retail, wine, franchising industries before he moved into Belperio Clark. He's worked on a wide array of commercial matters, including business transfers, employment agreements, and disputes and commercial leasing. Excellent. There's a strong understanding of the commercial and financial considerations that impact clients and generate options that maximise the benefit of a transaction. So you may be thinking of going down that path, but again, the benefit of independent advice may send you down a different path. Where a dispute has arisen, it takes a pragmatic approach to resolve the dispute outside of litigation. We like that because that fits in with our alternative dispute resolution model where possible in the most cost effective way. He considers both the short term strategy of a matter and the long term goals. What are we trying to achieve here? Clients trust him to advise on family structures and business exit strategies. Again, one of the complex areas is family business succession strategies and dealing with those. A uh, whole range of other areas, including self-managed super funds, with a view to protecting your business and hard work. When he's not being a lawyer, he enjoys taking his children to the park, going for a run, something I should do, uh, exploring wineries across South Australia, including the Clare Valley and the Abbey Hills. Excellent. He has a strong interest in continued learning and has completed his Master of Laws through the University of Melbourne. So it's very, very well qualified. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Polchan, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to just raise a couple of points as following on from some of John's comments. Uh, having worked on both sides of the fence for acting for large clients and also for small business owners, and <coughs> you know, some of the part of our practice now is for small business owners, I uh, can't emphasize en enough how much larger companies want to fall back on the contract and hate with a vengeance with huge passion industry codes. Uh, those co and that's why these codes have been developed over the years. So there's the, uh, the, not the, the, the wine industry code, but there's the, there's the franchising code, uh, there's the Retail Commercial Leases Act, all these various le levels of legislative and industry code protection for small businesses and have the Small Business Commissioner Office there to help enforce those codes. Because even when you have companies sign up to these industry codes, or if they're mandated, sometimes it's pulling teeth, getting people to the, to the table. 
So if ever something, I guess it's one of the messages from today's presentation, if something doesn't seem right, uh, whether it's in the contract or just in conduct, uh, seek advice, uh, call a lawyer, call the Small Business Commissioner Office, for some things call the ACCC, just say this doesn't seem right. Invariably, the Small Business Commissioner Office, the ACCC, they can't give you legal advice. Uh, but they'll be able to point you in the right direction, say, well, here's some information, uh, uh, pamphlets that you know, point you in the right direction, and then also uh, you, know, you have to just contact a lawyer and see if uh, you can't get some advice on the point. So thank you to everyone for coming this evening uh, and, and for those watching my webinar as well. Uh, regarding questions, uh, I'm more than happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, the, I've been provided a list of everyone who's attending today and, and watching my webinar and it's a very broad range of industry background. So the presentation has been tailored on a very generic basis and I understand that sometimes people have very specific questions so where I can, I'll answer it, uh, but quite often I'll, just in the interest of uh, presentation for everyone, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll just ask if I can answer the questions for you at the end of the presentation, just tap me on the shoulder and we can talk about it then. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is obviously about contracts. Uh, they impact everyone. <coughs> and I guess the one question on is, what's everyone's understanding of a contract? But I'm a big believer in audience engagement, so I call it a bit of chocolate motivation. Uh, so what's everyone's understanding of contract? Agreement between two parties. Sorry? Agreement between two parties. That's it, spot on. Let's see how it runs. Okay, I'm gonna run this one. Uh, so it's about agreement. The, the common misconception is just it's about the document. Uh, what does the, you know, the written document say? And that is certainly a predominant part of it. But probably the first third of this presentation is going to be about the negotiating process. So everything that leads up to forming the agreement, because that's what the court's going to hold you to, not just what's, you know, the written document is a reflection of that agreement. But it doesn't have to be written, it doesn't have to be signed, and a court will still hold you to it. So this is some of the tips and traps for small business owners when negotiating these contracts. Whether you are the one negotiating with employees, obviously, whether you're the one initiating the negotiation, or whether you're the one who's dealing with the larger party, uh, these are some of the things you need to, get, to get, bear in mind. Now, with the slide here, uh, who has felt like the person at the end of the night who's after signed the contract? Oh, terrible. Who, who, who here signed a bank loan? The very first bank loan you signed, I bet everyone felt like that at some point in the time. So thinking, what did I sign? You know, should I sign this? Should I talk to my bank manager more? I'm going to stress a bit more. And uh, invariably, I didn't do it the first time I signed a bank loan. You don't read the product disclosure statement, the 20 pages of the, you know, the letter of offer, the another 30 pages of the contractual terms. The, and I'm a lawyer and I didn't read it. Uh, because in that case, I know, well, either I want the loan or I don't. My negotiating power in that case is very limited. There are other protections that you have in the case of a banking contract anyhow, but uh, invariably you have that level of stress and what on earth did I sign? And that's what this presentation is about, about informing and empowering small business owners. So that way, you know the process a bit more, you know what's in your contract a bit more, know what to look for a bit more, and remembering that you can negotiate. Don't take on a bad deal or a bad contract unnecessarily. So the process, this presentation is broken up into three stages of contracting. So when we're forming the contract, the deal is agreed, some of the terms to watch out for in the contract, and then finally, the contract's done, signed, whether it's signed or not signed. But at some point, things are coming to an end, uh, relationships have soured a bit, someone wants out, whatever the reason, uh, how do we end the contract? So, looking at the first stage. So this is largely about when we have a contract that's not, uh, it's not signed. 
So when the contract is signed, obviously the contract's been formed, very easy. But when there's a contract that's not signed, this happens a heck of a lot in business. Uh, what happens? And a court has three general categories. There's a fourth one which I won't touch on, but there's three general categories that they look at. So the first one, the parties have negotiated everything, all the essential terms have been agreed on, the price, the timing, you know, key liabilities, uh, and we just need to document it. But everyone's understanding is that it's fine right now. Second step, Everyone's agreed the key to essential terms, uh, the price, the timing, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but we're still not going to be bound to anything until we've signed on the dotted line. So that gives parties still a bit of time to get out. Uh, sometimes the written document comes back and parties are a bit unsure. But then we have the third category, which is they may have agreed on all the key essential terms, but we're not, we're, nothing is binding until there's two sets of signatures or three or four, how many parties are to this agreement on that contract. So, uh, some of the, I'm going to go over a few cases, not from a you know, legal perspective, as much as just a fact-based perspective, so you can see how courts try and put people into these categories, and also how through the process you can shift from one category to another. So you may have thought, uh, and we're making clear in the writing, it's not category two. It's not meant to be binding until everyone's signed. But the party's conduct shifts it to category one. And all of a sudden the court says, well, actually, everyone really wanted this to be binding right now. So it's binding. And this happens because somewhere along the way, either people think they'll go right when they're planning, or uh, they sometimes get a better offer. And they want out of the con and they want out of this deal, so they think, oh, I haven't signed, I'm at, uh, I'm not bound. The other party uh, stands up and says, well, actually, my understanding was this was binding straight away. And the courts left to try and figure out what's going on here. So if you want to stay in a particular category, you've got to be really clear. And sometimes you have to repeat a message. Uh, there's some uh, firms that have this practice of any email when it's when it's a contract negotiation. Uh, they repeat, not binding until executed, or words to that effect. Uh, and I put down here a few simple words, subject to contract. Uh, there's a general understanding of that. I have to put a disclaimer on that, that if you use those words when you're negotiating, bear in mind that, again, your conduct, you can have said those words, your conduct can shift you from one category to another. But if you put the word subject to contract, more often than not, you're saying, I'm in category three. I am not intending to be bound until I see a document, until everything's signed, until there is a written contract. Uh, but do bear in mind that your conduct will shift you around a bit. So let's look at some of the examples. Now this is based on an Israeli case. It's actually, there was, I think, seven emoji. So this was a contract that the parties were held to by SMS. So uh, it was a residential tenancy. <coughs> Uh, it was based in Israel, but the, the principles would be applied here. If the same facts are here, it would probably be held. And the uh, landlord has advertised his property for sale, not for sale, for, for rent. Uh, a couple's gone in, uh, they like it. There's a little bit of backwards and forwards negotiations with the landlord's rent. Eventually, the rents uh, agree, and the couple send this series of emoji to the landlord. And the landlord's response is, they're clearly happy, they've accepted. Uh, so he pulls the advertisement down, thinking, well, uh, I'm just going to get the lease documented and <coughs> uh, signed, and uh, we can all keep marching. And somewhere over the next couple of weeks, the tenants find another property they like instead. Uh, I can't remember if it was less or more rent, but they say, well, we don't want this house, uh, this uh, it was an apartment anymore, we want another one. And the landlord says, I have a binding agreement. You accepted by those that's that by that text message there. And the court agreed with that. Uh, and you know, gave him one month of rent as damages. So most of the examples that I'm giving are based on email communications, but we're seeing you know, see cases now where emojis come through and there's all sorts of studies been going on about what the different emoji mean, because it 
get a bunch of legal scholars together and there's like a, a, you know, a thinking phase emoji. And if, if that came through in a, a correspondence, well, that's what that means. Uh, now, if it's not clear, then there's probably not an attention to be bound. But in this case, where there's you know, a smiley face, two high fives, someone dancing, I think there was a champagne bottle, uh, obviously someone is celebrating. Uh, now, we've got, now we've got two Australian cases. So this one is a Western Australian case. Uh, a lot of the cases, I don't go through that many, but the cases that I do, do go through, invariably involve property leasing or property sales, and that's just because quite often there's a large amount of money at stake. So, uh, in this case, uh, the lease, uh, oh sorry, the lease negotiation, uh, so there's an agreement for lease, and it has those three lines there at the top. The landlord sends an email on the 4th of June asking for confirmation. Uh, the tenant responds saying, I'm happy with the terms. Now they talk about a sublease here because uh, the tenant actually didn't want to stay in this premise. He wanted to sublease it. So <coughs> in the process of all of this, he's trying to find a sub subtenant. But that sublease uh, was not a condition of this agreement. They just knew it was happening in the background. Uh, somewhere along the way, the final lease is then not signed. And the question is, uh, the landlord wants to hold the tenant to the lease, saying, you've accepted. The tenant says, uh, I'm not bound to this. You know, look at what your agreement for lease said. Uh, so it says there, uh, well, this wording is probably a bit clearer, but regardless, he was trying to rely on an ambiguity in, those, in the wording there, saying, well, this is really reliant on documentation of there's some additional background to this, but I'll go into that in a sec. But uh, whose thoughts are on whether that should be binding or not, even though there's nothing signed? Absolutely. Hmm? Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're right. Here we go. Talk with courage. Oh, sorry, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> Keep playing frustrated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there were some additional factors that came into this, which sort of affirmed the court's view, uh, which was that it was an existing tenant. So the lease had expired and they were in a monthly uh, holding over period. So for, who's here who's got a, a lease, a commercial lease of some sort? I have a small business, I have a commercial lease. But invariably, you'll deal, you'll deal with it at some point. Uh, and so it was a monthly holding over at the end and they were negotiating for some time. Uh, so. The court looked at that, looked at the clause, looked at this point here about you know, the tenant was clearly accepting things. It was only later when the tenant couldn't get the sub-tenant they were looking for uh, that they then said, well, we don't want to take on this lease for another five years, we want out. Uh, and then the landlord said, no, nope, you're stuck with this. So the tenant was bound. And, uh, so if the tenant had wanted out, if they would have needed to be really clear, they could have said, Vantage is happy with the terms. Uh, please proceed to open this up, uh, not binding until signed. Something, it doesn't have to be complicated legal jargon, something really simple that just says, I'm not bound to this until something is signed. Now we've got a Queensland case, the Stellar's case. So this involved the sale and purchase of a business and a property. Uh, it was a service station. Can I just ask a question? Just yes. Very easy oh, yeah. um, I'm just going to be really clear on that too, right? because if you're if you're clearly saying that it's not binding, mm -hmm. then that regret also works in reverse for you. That's right. It is so, a two-way street. Right. So, the, so the landlord then in that case could get something better, boot you out, yep. and you. So just for the people on the webinar, the the comment was the uh, if you're making an intention, it's not binding that can work against you. So the landlord can then say, well, you don't want to be bound by this yet. Uh, so, uh, and it's not, bound, uh, it's not binding until everyone's signed. So I found a better offer and I'm kicking you out. And I go into this a little bit later on. In a lot of 
uh, lease offers, you will notice that the lease, uh, the agreement for lease is drafted from the point of view of uh, this is the lessee's offer to the landlord. Even though the landlord has prepared the document, they've given it to you and they say that this is the lessee's offer. You sign it and in the background, the landlord is negotiating with other people, other tenants for that space. So the landlord can always turn it and say, even though they prepared it, they can always say, no, nah, it's a, not binding, I found a better deal, match the rent or uh, they're going to get it. Uh, there is some protection under the Retail Commercial Leases Act for existing tenants in that situation, uh, but not for new tenants. So for Stella's case, it's the sale and purchase of a uh, service station. The purchaser comes along, makes a verbal offer to purchase, uh, but it's subject to due, uh, due diligence. It's, a, it's typical with a service station. There's a lot of environmental risks. Uh, petrol gets seeped into, into the soil. You want to do the checks. Uh, the vendor sends an email with the terms of the sale, the price, deposit, settlement date, all the key things. There's a, a bit more backwards and forwards with the emails. Uh, but then eventually, the buyer confirms the offer, subject to contract and due diligence as previously discussed, and asks for the offer to be accepted immediately. The seller then sends an email accepting the offer, subject to execution of the contract provided. And there's a draft contract in the email. The buyer then seeks further amendments. Uh, and in, so, there's only a few amendments they saw. So one of them was about the due diligence period, uh, and one of them was about removing a guarantee. In the meantime, the seller has found a higher bidder. And so the seller wants out of the contract, saying, well, this isn't binding. And you've got there, I think it was light, but it says subject to execution of the contract. That was my terms of acceptance. And the court said, you may have written this down, but you immediately accepted. That was the terms of their acceptance. It had to be accepted immediately. And you've said you've accepted. The fact you put a caveat on the end, subject to execution of the contract, didn't fly. And they held the, uh, the seller to the contract. So even though uh, the seller had put those words there, they still weren't protected because their conduct throughout all the email negotiations said something else. The fact they that the seller said, well, the buyer came back with amendments. So they don't even want to be bound by this. And the court said, well, they weren't significant amendments. It wasn't like they were trying to negotiate the price again. They were just a few minor amendments in the grand scheme of things. So if the buyer had come back saying, oh, this price doesn't work, uh, I need to cut it off by $100,000, uh, then the court would have probably said, well, Clearly, no one understands there any, uh, there's any sort of acceptance here. But in this case, the buyer only sought minor amendments, uh, and the seller was really just trying to get out of the deal because he got a better price. So the court focused on this fact that this was the point of acceptance. So this was this was the uh, offer, and the seller accepted at that point in time. Couldn't later renege on the deal. So the point of you know, this case is got to be really careful because this shifted it from we go back to the, you know, these three general categories. Uh, it shifted it from category two where we said it's only only binding on execution of the contract to category one, immediately binding, and the documentation is just a formality, and it wasn't wasn't even intended, which is a bit questionable, but. Uh, the point is you've got to be really careful in your conduct and what you're communicating. Just on that, yes. what, what role did the seller buying another buying another buyer? Like <laughs> if they knocked out another seller and just you know the word of those amendments you're not interested in proceeding, would that have been a different outcome? Probably not. Uh, we do we say to our clients, judges are human. Uh, and I had a, a barrister one time who acted as a deputy judge in the UK uh, make this comment to me that 
invariably when they're presented with a problem, the first thing a judge looks for is say, what's really going on behind the scenes here? So in this case, the fact that the seller had found an alternative contract, yeah, I can't say one way or the other, but I suspect it may have played on the judge's mind. But from a legal perspective, it shouldn't impact anything. So we looked at conduct and forming a contract. Uh, some of the other things that come about when we are forming contracts is promises, representations. Uh, uh, a common example is in leases. Uh, the landlord says, well, this is the way we normally do things here. Poor trading hours, uh, the way you know co the common area operates, how we deal with our tenants. And the tenant thinks, great, this is wonderful. They don't bother reading the lease uh, and sign away. And all of a sudden, the landlord either changes their mind or sometimes the landlord's comments were made honestly, but the leasing agent or the um, centre manager has changed or the landlord sells. Uh, and the new landlord has a different approach. And when the tenant says, well, you promised me that uh, I could do this, the first thing they go to is one of these boilerplate clauses at the back of the lease in clause 323 subsection C and say, that says, this agreement is the entire agreement. <coughs> All prior representations are expressly excluded. Uh, the ACCC doesn't like these sort of clauses anymore under unfair contract terms legislation, which we'll talk about, but uh, regardless, uh, you have this hurdle to get over. At law, you can still use, a, you can still make a claim of that uh, you relied on those prior representations and notwithstanding the clause in the contract, uh, that clause is not effective. Uh, quite simply, it's just, it's odd. Not that it's not right, but more a case of there's equitable principles that apply. But, the court looks really strongly on this clause. So that's why I made this point to you about the weight of the evidence, particularly when you're going in a magistrate's court. Magistrates deal with about 50 cases a day. And if you come to them uh, with uh, a contract or and say, well, the contract says this, Your Honor, but uh, there are all these uh, promises. You can take a surefire bet what the other side's going to say, either I never said that, or look at the contract. Uh, notwithstanding those promises, you still entered into the contract, uh, and the contract says something else, so you may have changed your mind later on. And you have to establish that you entered into those contracts on the basis of those promises. And it's a really high threshold. So when magistrates have 50 cases a day and they start getting into character evidence, it's very easy for them to defer straight away to the contract, saying, this is what the contract says, it's signed, it evidences a clear intention, uh, I'm gonna have to start getting involved down in character evidence, and what from not? And this is just anecdotal, but they'll get a side with the contract. Uh, and it's just purely a function of you know, time, and there's a huge difficulty and pressure on judges to make that sort of character evidence. So especially when they've only got like an hour with you in the magistrate's court trial, but sometimes it's a bit longer, but a lot of trials are very short and you've got to have a really high hurdle of evidence to uh, get around this sort of clause. So the point is, read the documents. The number of clients we see who say, oh, you know, we've got this contract, what do you think? First thing we say is, you read it. No, of course not. That's what I come to you for. <laughs> and we just got smacked. Uh, and so the, you know, we have to go through it with the client bit by bit. And the first thing we say, you know, one question along the way is, you know, especially when I get to the point, <coughs> all right, what promises have been made? What's your understanding of the deal? We start drilling into some of the commercial matters a bit more. Uh, and I, I use poor trading hours as an example because that uh, is, is a matter I had to deal with recently. So a client said, oh, yeah, this is what the, the landlord promised me on poor trading hours. And uh, I don't have to open for these hours. We looked at the lease and I was like, sorry, the lease says the exact opposite. And it gives you a charge if you don't open. So that's why you read the document. And if you don't understand it, get legal advice, of course. But start with at least that first step.
get it in writing. The two most common issues as general categories that we see with contracts are one category, <coughs> nothing's in writing. And then there's a dispute at some point along the way and everyone is wondering, uh, what was the agreement? Is there an agreement? Uh, what were the terms of this agreement? And you have to look through years of evidence, history, background, quite often there's you know, bits and pieces of, of uh, background, especially when sometimes relationships have broken down over 10 or 20 years. Uh, I had one matter where the relationship went back to around early 2000. We realized, oh, there actually weren't that many emails back in early 2000. It's only faxes. And most of the faxes have been destroyed. Trying to piece together what everyone agreed at that point in time was really tricky. Uh, so get it in writing. Uh, with that point, and then the second category is people have got it in writing and the terms are not really clear. Uh, either it's bad drafting uh, from unlikely, unfortunately, lawyers, or uh, it's just uh, things have been missed or whatever it is. Uh, with this message of get it in writing, uh, we are seeing more and more clients relying on our dear friend, Mr. Google. Uh, the, you can certainly do that. You'll get wonderful, wonderful contracts that are enforceable in the state of Nebraska. <laughs> uh, if you're going to do that, our recommendation is you know, please read these books first and then play around with the contract because you'll understand a bit more of the issues of interpretation, drafting, disputes, what goes wrong, uh, best practice. Uh, Otherwise, our default is please see a lawyer. Uh, if not me, see someone. Uh, we know lawyers are an expense. It was building on John's comments from earlier. Uh, but even just getting one hour of advice saves you hundreds of hours later on when something goes wrong. Uh, common examples where uh, something with ideally should have, they should have something in mind. Family loans. Uh, the law says there's a presumption of advancement, which basically means uh, mum and dad have lent money to son or daughter to buy a house. Uh, and the parents think of it as a loan. The kid thinks of it as a gift. Uh, I don't want to pay this money back. Uh, until, well, and regardless, sometimes, you know, everyone's just fine going with the status quo on that one. That, that's a very common. Until about two years later, uh, young, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pick on Stevie here. Young Stevie, uh, uh, my wife, please don't leave me. Uh, young Stevie uh, meets someone and that's all great. And two years later, things don't go well. And when the, the, when the spouse is claiming on the estate, well, on, on the, on Stevie's property, Stevie says, well, mum and dad lent me $100,000. And then all of a sudden it's a question, and so we need to pay that money back. If it's a gift, the parents aren't entitled to anything. If it's a loan, then it's always sitting there and the parents get that money back before yeah, the estate is split up. And so the question is, but if it goes to court and there's nothing in writing, the first thing the court says is, well, this was a gift. That's our starting point, it's a presumption. You can rebut it, but you've got to have some strong evidence to rebut it. And so you know, the parents can be the ones who lose out. Just yes. a quick question. If you did that and they put a caveat on the property, would that cover you? Uh, that, that, would be, uh, that would be one of those uh, factual points that would be a uh, rebutting presumption. Rebut, that would rebut the presumption, absolutely. Because now you've got to be careful here because you can only lodge a caveat if you have a property. So, sorry, the question is, if you lodge the cat, there's, uh, I've watched webinars before and the questions from the audience aren't often heard by the, by the viewers on web, uh, uh, sitting at home or at their office. So the question is, if you lodge the caveat, would that help you in the family line situation? And the answer is it would. You just have to be very careful because you can only lodge a caveat if you have a proprietary interest. And just because you've got a family loan and because that loan is for property, doesn't necessarily give you that proprietary interest in the land. 
There has to be an understanding that the parents would secure uh, their loan against the property there. So you just have to be careful of that one. And ideally, you would write it up. Uh, it doesn't have to be too complicated again, uh, but something should be there. But yes, that would certainly be in the parents' favour. Uh, having said that, we've seen cases where the caveat comes along once the spouse leaves. Uh, that's not going to help you very much. Uh, part performance with an unreason contract. So I'm going to go to another example. So uh, this is when the parties have started doing something. They've, they've, they've agreed on something. They've started doing something. But it's just not written down yet. And so the court's left this quandary of, well, <coughs> did they mean for this to be a concluded agreement? Or is it just part of the way there? So in this case, uh, the purchaser approaches a farm owner and says, uh, I want to buy your farm. Uh, the farm was quite large and there was a, a mining interest in part of the land because it's so large and there's minerals on the ground. And the owner of the farm had an agreement already with an adjoining neighbour saying uh, if that they would give them a right of first refusal, which basically means if uh, someone approached them to buy the land, they must offer it to their adjoining neighbour first. And in this case, the purchasers approached, said, or well, the prospective purchasers approached the owner of the land saying, I want to buy it. Uh, I forget the exact number, so I'm just going to say a million dollars. Uh, agree on the, yeah, you can have it up front in seven days. Settlement in seven days, here's a million dollars. The owner of the land says, uh, look, I accept your deal, but subject to this right of first refusal, because I have to you know, honour that agreement as well. And so everyone agrees, there's, a, there's an agreement there. The owner of the land goes to the neighbour and says, well, they've, cut, they've offered a million dollars in seven days, what do you think? And the neighbouring owner says, I can't, and I'm going to adapt the facts a little bit, but largely, uh, I can't do a million dollars in seven days, but I can do $50,000 uh, tomorrow and another $950,000 in 14 days. And the owner of the farm likes the neighbour, doesn't really know this prospective purchaser, and comes back saying, sorry, uh, I've got another buyer. Who thinks uh, the owner of the land, now not based on whether it's nice or not, but who thinks the owner of the land should be held to, the, to this agreement with the prospective purchaser? Oh, the, what, well, firstly, uh, in this case, there was nothing written down. It's all just, it was established though that there was this oral discussion here, uh, and everyone agreed on those sort of facts. Uh, now, in the case of property, ordinarily you should have, there's legislation that says it needs to be in writing if you're looking at a property transaction. Uh, but the exception is when there's part performance. That's why I like this one, this example here. So, uh, ordinarily, message for property should be in writing. The uh, land house office won't let you do anything otherwise. Uh, but there are exceptions that would, you, know, you have to get a court order on it. But uh, there are exceptions when it's part performance. So, who thinks the owner? Who thinks the owner should have been bound to sell to the prospective purchaser? Yep. He's just changing it. That's right. Yeah. So, um, we're too here for property. Sorry. Thank you. All right, so it's better I give these away or else my belt buckle gets a bit tight. Uh, so the first question in that case was, uh, because the owner says, well, uh, they did come back uh, and match the uh, and match the offer, <coughs> and the court easily dismissed that, saying, well, no, it was a different offer, uh, and it wasn't to your advantage because it wasn't like they said, oh, we can do. $50,000 today and the other nine fifty in six days, which would have been better to you. It was a longer payment period and a really complex arrangement they came up with. Uh, well, then the second question was, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a moment. Uh, 
uh, was there enough there to get this contract across? The, was there enough to establish an agreement? Uh, in this case, what got it across the line was that the owner of the land approached the neighbour. So there's no way the owner would have done that if the prospective purchaser hadn't put this, this binding <coughs> offer out there. So that part performance is what got it across the line there for the prospective purchaser. The other example is that we that we often see is co-owner agreement. Uh, so joint ventures, shareholders, co-owners, whatever the arrangement, but basically a group of business partners who get together for a venture of some sort. So quite sometimes it's someone owns the land and someone's got the the uh, property skills. Uh, another case is someone's got the industry knowledge, but someone else has got the money. Uh, and they partner together to get this business up and running. And there's a bit of a shake, a handshake agreement, and <coughs> two years later, things haven't worked out, and they come running to our office for help. Or one party comes running to our office saying, I want you to get my money back from the other person. Or, or, or conversely, I want you to get me out of this contract. Uh, no, I won't say contract, I'll say agreement. And this is none of those examples where coin agreements, you know, they're not the cheapest things to put together, they're not that extensive, but putting something together uh, just saves you hours and hours and hours of pain in the future. Uh, seen cases where the cost to dispute, and unfortunately in a lot of cases they do end up in dispute, but somewhere along the way the relationship sours. Uh, and if you don't have a strong agreement to secure you there or a really strong relationship to get things back on track, and at least someone's going to run up to the water. Uh, and they can, the cost of the dispute can be easily 10 times the cost of getting the, the document drawn up. So get something in writing as much as possible. <coughs> uh, quite often in this formation process, there'll be a term sheet, a heads of agreement, a memorandum of understanding. Uh, and when you're signing these things or negotiating them, there's always that question, we've rehashed this point a bit, but is it to be binding? Uh, had one case where a client, and because lawyers can slow the process down, you know, I, even if we drop everything, I'm not going to give advice with, you know, on 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I can do my best to do it in, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, but I had a client come to me one time saying, Steve, I've got this deal. Uh, I need an answer in 10 minutes. Sorry, we've got a 40 page document. There's no way I can do this. Even if I drop everything right now, and I could, but uh, 10 minutes is, is not enough time. Oh, but it has to be done. All right, give me the document. I had an um, agreement, uh, heads of agreement, and also a standard terms contract at the back. And sure enough, there was a clause that said, you know, this, this will be binding straight away uh, to that effect. So all I wrote down was subject to legal review. And go back and say, here, sign this, off you go. And politely, off you go. Uh, and sure enough, about six months later, this contract still hadn't been signed. But things had progressed. You know, the parties were proceeding with things. But just the document, had, and the document had been prepared, it just hadn't signed yet. And it hadn't come to me for review. And Six months later, the client says, uh, this is not working for me. I need to negotiate the, uh, the dollars. Uh, and so the first question to me was, can I do that? <coughs> I looked over and said, oh yeah, we wrote subject to legal review and we stopped it. Tell your harvest. And so my client went to the other side and said, sorry, if you want me to stay, on, to stay in this, uh, I need to uh, uh, review the dollars. The other side weren't happy to hear that. They've been receiving for six months now. But ultimately, uh, they decided to, they, they, the first question they came back with was, oh, is this binding or not? And didn't put up a fight at all on the point. So now, again, the disclaimer, your conduct may say something else. But generally, if you've put down something like subject to contract, subject to legal review, you'll generally have that protection there that you didn't intend to be bound straight away. Now, this is an example of a term sheet that I developed with one client. You don't always have to do this. Uh, this, and you don't definitely don't have to do it like this. This is something that suited the client. 
Uh, but when you are negotiating, a lot of contracts are the same. And you then start arguing the legal terms of these contracts over and over and over again. Sometimes you just want a standard term sheet or a series of amendments that you can give to the other side saying, look, I know you've got your standard terms and conditions. Here's my standard series of amendments. And when we're negotiating the agreement, let's just talk about this now. The benefit of doing this, other than it saves, it brings the problem forward rather than everyone's agreed, and then it comes to the lawyer for review and it gets stuck backwards and forwards for negotiations in the legal terms for the next three months. And everyone thinks, well, the deal was done, wasn't it? Uh, what's, what's stopping it? Oh, the lawyer's become a bottleneck. So we developed this process to say, let's bring, let's, let's bring this negotiation right to the beginning. Because this here, some of these points were critical to this client. This was a, a, a leasing client who had, and assigned a lot of leases, not as a landlord, this is a tenant. And he got sick of signing, of negotiating leases over and over again. Uh, so not negotiating leases, but negotiating the terms of the lease over and over again. So he brought the process forward and said to the landlord, well, these are my essential terms. And we did the color coding system, like a red and a yellow, a traffic lights, just to keep it really simple. Uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, that's not very common, but we just tried to make it really easy to read. The key thing though was, uh, this is, uh, taken, there was a uh, water blurb at the start, I removed that, uh, and I've removed obviously the client details, and um, there's quite a few pages of, the, of these amendments, but the key one that I've left here is, uh, there's no binding agreement until there's a uh, final lease document executed by the parties, uh, and the final lease shall be on terms acceptable to both parties, acting upon legal advice. Really made it crystal clear this is not binding until the very end of the process. Now, on the point of uh, these uh, heads of agreement or <coughs> commercial terms or memorandums of understanding or any sort of contract, now, this is not just negotiating, but you've got the final document. Really, really clear on offer and acceptance. Uh, Common examples where it can go wrong, employment agreements and service agreements. So employment agreements, uh, this feeds onto the comment that was made before, where it can backfire on you. So if you're an employer, you've prepared the document and quite often it will say, uh, this is my offer to the employee to hire you on these terms. And the employee can, until they accept it, can obviously chop around for employment with another person. So sometimes employees don't like that and they put it on, put it around, the, the other way around, saying, uh, this is your offer to me, the employer, to hire, to employ you. Bit perverse, but that's what the contract says. So you've got to get this, but then once the employee signs, it's then with the employer to accept or reject it or not. And so it's, it's just about which way it's meant to work because it is a two-way street. You can't have it both ways. And the service agreement is an example of that where a service agreement can be, or hire agreement, they can be complicated because you've got the purchase order, you've got the standard terms and conditions, uh, you've got the invoice sometimes from part of the contract because there's no payment terms on the, intro, on the invoice. And there's a question about, well, which one is, if there's inconsistencies, which one's going to prevail? And I saw one example, which I'll go through in a moment, where the purchase order said, this is, I think I shall jump to the slide now. This offer is an offer by the purchaser. And then in the standard terms and conditions, it said, and I've amended the words a little bit, but uh, these standard terms and conditions constitute the offer by the company. <coughs> Complete diametrically opposite ends of the spectrum here. And if this went to a court to argue, Court probably just throw their hands in the air and say, you know, mediate. Uh, it's, so you just get really clear, especially when there's multiple documents forming the one contract, uh, make sure everything's consistent. But also understanding what, which do you want it to be. I'd have a good discussion with the client when this came to me. Uh, say, all right, what, what, what do you want it to be? When do you want to accept? Because if they put the offer to you, my client was a supplier, if they put the offer to you, uh, then you have the choice to accept, but that means until you accept, they can revoke the offer at any point in time. 
So an offer that's unaccepted is not binding. So it has to be accepted. You can always pull out, pull out. Once they've accepted, you can't. But then conversely, if it's the other way around, you put the offer to them, and they may be shopping around for another deal. So you can't have it both ways. Which one suits you better? Uh, and then watching out for lease agreements, we've talked about that. So uh, when it says this is the lessee's offer. Uh, now these are just some examples, but invariably you're just going to be really clear about who's making the offer and who's accepting it. Just because you've written the document doesn't mean that you're the one making the offer. You can, through the contract, turn it around. All right, so I think we've gone over the you know, some tips and traps for the negotiating stage forming the contract, now we're actually going to look at the terms of the contract. And one thing, the one message that we always try and stress to our clients is be reasonable in what you're negotiating. I, I've seen some clients over the years who say, no, push them on the price, push them on the liability, push them, push them, push them. And then six months later, the other side has capitulated because they've got so many onerous conditions on this contract. And the uh, client says, well, what, do you want, uh, what, can we, what can I do about it? Well, you can sue them, but they've probably lost everything because you put so many um, uh, harsh terms in this contract. Got to be, be a bit reasonable if you want this to be a long term prospect. Doesn't mean compromise yourself commercially or legally, but it's got to be reasonable in the process of it. So, obviously, in this case, uh, you'd be surprised if this relationship was going to go much further. Uh, if it doesn't seem reasonable, so if someone's come to you with a contract, get advice. Uh, take control of the process. Don't feel like you have to sign something. The best advice someone gave me some time ago was uh, he refused to take a bad, bad deal. Uh, he had, when he first started out in business, sometimes you don't have much choice when you're first starting out. Uh, but he did his first two deals and they were terrible for him. So in that quite a few years. And after that he said, I'm not taking on a bad deal. I've learned what are the bad ones over the years, and I refuse to do it because it sets me back too far. I'd rather wait and now and then look out for what I think is going to be the, the, the right deal for me. Uh, get advice. Call Small Business Commission office. Look at the ACCC, ACCC website. Uh, failing that, call a lawyer. Uh, and the other thing is slow things down even by a day. Sometimes, and I do understand, especially around 30 during or just before Christmas, uh, there's huge pressure to get things done. Uh, 30, June, so 30 June just ties into the financial year, and people will put things in one financial year or the other for tax reasons, whatever it is. But nonetheless, uh, and, I, and uh, I had a client once only came to me and said, Stephen, I need this uh, and I need an answer straight away. I uh, looked and said, Well, yeah, yes, you can do this, but I don't think this is the best option. Uh, but I need 24 hours to look at this. And he wasn't happy about that. He said, oh, can you do it an hour? So, no, this cannot happen. I do need 24 hours to look at this. And so he accepted. And then 24 hours later, the next day, sure enough, I promise, I came to him and said, uh, I still maintain this is not the best option. You can do it if you want. But here are some other options that I think are better. And he was over the moon because they were better. Uh, this was just me, but you know, selling myself. Okay? That, you know, one of them in particular was commercially and legally far better for him. And he went back to the other side and got that deal done. So just by waiting 24 hours, quite often you'll wake up feeling different, especially if there's a dispute going on. But when you're talking about negotiating a contract, uh, new ideas come along. If you can slow the process down a bit. Oops, sorry. <coughs> All right. It may not be enforceable. So. Uh, if it doesn't seem reasonable, quite often now there is legislative protection there for you. So there's what's called unfair contract terms legislation. That there is designed to say that any clauses in a, in a contract, and applies to 98% of business contracts now, uh, if it's uh, unfair, and what that means, still up for discussion, but there's uh, let in the Act, uh, there's some guidance on the point, and there's a few cases now that provide some guidance, plus the ACCC has got a plethora of information there providing guidance on the point. Uh, what they think to be is unfair, 
it's going to create a, a significant imbalance in the parties. Uh, was this term transparent? Uh, so the court looks at all these sort of things and determines whether it's unfair or not. Uh, but you do have that protection there. <coughs> Ipso facto clauses, which is basically uh, most contracts have this clause in there that says when you terminate and, oh sorry, if you go insolvent, the other party has the right to terminate straight away. And the government didn't like this because it was frustrating administrators trying to turn companies around. So they've made this legislation, which has been commonly called ipsa facto legislation, and it basically means that those sort of clauses are put on hold for a period of time. So that way administrators can't step in and try and turn things around. So if you're the one going through administration, you can say, well, uh, and someone says, I want out of the contract. Well, hopefully you probably have an administrator at that point anyhow, but uh, rely on those, that sort of legislation. Penalty clauses, there's been a lot of cases on this in the past couple of years, particularly with banking cases. Uh, when a clause <coughs> says liquidated damages or it says interest, if you are late in paying, we get to charge you 20% interest. Uh, there's a you know, principles of law that say, we don't like this. It's penalizing the other person. The only person who can impose a penalty is uh, basically the crown. So penalties, it has to be, you have to justify the interest rate. You have to justify the amount for the liquidated damages. If you can't justify it and you're saying, oh, I just put 10% there because that seemed reasonable, sometimes it can be 3%. You've got to have a rationale behind the percentage charge. And then terms against public policy. So restraints of trade are a common one. Uh, a, client came, a client came to me uh, some time ago and said, oh, I've been asked to sign this restraint deed. What do you think? I said, well, it's probably not enforceable anyhow. Sign it, don't sign it. Not really, you know, but we, we pushed back and negotiated. But public policy says we don't like restraints. We don't like saying to someone, you sign this contract, you walk away, you can't do anything for 12 months or six months or two years, whatever it is. Because we want, A, it's against competition, that's the public policy element. But practically, we don't want people to not be able to earn an income. There are a few exceptions. Now, when I say exceptions, few category, established categories that the court will entertain an argument from because you can enforce the restraint if it's reasonable in the circumstances. But it's a really high threshold. So would that be the case, say I can sell my business mm -hmm. to a competitor and drop the money, and then there's a restraint of trade there for a period of time? That... Yep. The sale of business is one of the three main categories that courts will hear, and it's probably the category that has the greatest chance of success because typically there's been a large amount of money that's changed hands. Yep. So because of that, the court says, well, you were compensated. And you, you did, yes, there's this restraint, we don't like restraints, but you did receive a large amount of money from this. So this still has to be reasonable, you still have to protect something, but if money has changed hands, they're gonna say, oh, they're gonna entertain the argument a lot more. The other two comments, oh sorry. Yeah. So you're saying, so in the case of an employment contract that says that, you paid a big redundancy. Mm -hmm. um, an employment contract, probably less likely. Uh, there is a case of an employment contract, that, and employment contracts are the second category. Uh, there is a case where an employment contract was, or restraint was upheld, uh, but generally, uh, I think that's probably going to be the least category. I think uh, courts are not going to say we don't, we are, you can't go and earn an income. Uh, if you are do, if you are setting up a business right next door, you've got to be reasonable here. A court's probably going to say you've done the wrong thing here. Uh, you, they trained you up, they, you, they taught you everything. And now you just set up right next door. Obviously, you're taking away their customers. But if you set up, you know, and uh, you know, if you set up a business from home or a business three suburbs away, what is it that the, what's the legitimate interest that the business owner is trying to protect here? Uh, in the in the case of the employment contract, it was when uh, David Orberson, or whatever his name was, left Channel Seven as a senior executive to go to become the CEO of Channel Ten. I think that's his name, and Channel 7 sorts of enforced restraints straight away. And the court actually accepted it in that case because he was a senior executive of Channel 7, I think that was the Channel 7 station. He knew their strategies for the next one, two, three years. And he was at that very senior level and he was becoming, going to the same role at Channel 10 or a very similar role, senior executive role, with the ability to steer their st uh, strategic direction. And so Channel 7 did have some legitimate interest to protect there. 
So, but otherwise, you've got to really establish what is it you're trying to protect here. Uh, now, I've got a few examples there of unfair contract terms. Uh, you have to, I'm, I'm getting the, 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 the circling thing is saying to me to wrap this up. So, uh, in essence, I'm going to guide you to the HCC website of this one because they've got huge amounts of information on it. Uh, key things that, they, that the HCC are looking for on unfair contract terms is there a unilateral change? So, if one party can say, we can change the price at will, uh, sometimes they say, well, this is a legitimate interest. So this is from the TPG contract, the old one, and they changed it after a few years, the fighting with the HCC. Uh, and the TPG said, well, we are a telecommunications carriage provider. Uh, since we rely on a network, if there's a cost on that a cost increase in that network, we have to pass it on to our customers. And the HCC's view was, no, you can, so you can have this clause, but you've got to give them the chance to get out. You've got to give them 30 days notice or six days notice. You've got to give them some lead time and you've got to give them the chance to get out uh, without any penalties. So some quite often there's like a cancellation charge or something like that. If that there is a fair outcome, because otherwise the person has no choice but to accept the pass on of fees, whereas they may want to negotiate with someone else. This clause though was you know, very similar. This was from a credit provider. Uh, so again, this credit provider was passing on an increase in interest rates. This there, though is acceptable because there's legislative protection at this point. So what are, on the unfair contract terms, one exception to the rule is if there's an act of parliament that says you can do this, then even if it's unfair, it's been enshrined in legislation, it's protected. So don't take on a bad deal, everything's negotiable. Does the contract have termination rights with no notice? Uh, does the jurisdiction say all disputes must be resolved in Sydney? Uh, are there guarantors? Uh, now this is a very commercial term quite often. If you're not, if you're going to a bank and they say we want a personal guarantee, you have to give it. Okay. You, yeah, if you're a small business owner, you know, 99 out of 100 times you don't have the bargaining power to get around that. But in a normal business to business contract, if they say, oh, we want a, a personal guarantee, push back. Why do you have to accept it? You guys all work hard in your businesses. You don't want to bet the house on things. Uh, or if you can't push back on the guarantee, try and cap it. You don't have to take an unlimited guarantee. Try and cap it at something that's not going to put the house at risk. Uh, exclusivity. See, Time and again, someone's saying, oh, I negotiated with the other party, they gave me exclusive rights in this territory. Oh, wonderful, that's a great deal. Uh, let's have a look at the clause. Oh, it says, uh, the other party has to offer a, com uh, a kind of competing business in the territory to you first, and if you say no, then they can get someone else in. Now, that's a right of first refusal. But that's not really exclusivity. So it's exclusivity if you say yes, but you may have very good reason to say no. And so that's not really the protection you're after. And then also consumer guarantee law. Uh, I could spend hours talking about that, but in essence, you'll see clauses in the contract that say, uh, uh, and I'll talk about goods and services because that's what consumer guarantee law is largely about. Uh, if there's been a supply of goods or services and there's a defect in the good or the service that's been supplied, the supplier has the, the option to either resupply the good of the service or to compensate, well, to basically organize an alternative <coughs> supply of the good of the service. That there is half the story at Consumer Guarantee Law. So the Consumer Guarantee Law is actually legislative. Uh, that's half the story. So that there under the Act is what applies to a minor defect. There's also what's a major defect, which talks about well, there's been a complete failing of the good uh, or the service, then it's not the supplier who has the discretion, it's the consumer who has the discretion. And they have certain options that are available, so which are not just the resupply, you can then seek damages. So, but the contract is not that they're, incons not that they're inconsistent, they're just silent on that point. So, understand your rights there. And, it's hard because to go to the ACCC website uh, on that sort of info, to 
read all the information brochures I have out there, you'd be uh, spending weeks and weeks and weeks doing it. But I'm just here to try and inform and empower everyone here a bit more to say, oh, Steve said that I should be on the watch out for this, <coughs> and I'm not happy about this. All right, when the contract goes wrong, firstly, be reasonable in the deal. Draft the contract to avoid disputes. So don't place too much pressure on the other side, unless there's a commercial or legal reason to do it. Because if you place so much pressure on them, all well, likelihood, they're going to capitulate. And then they're left going to a dispute. Terminating the contract, be careful, get advice. Courts, out of, as a principle, do not like termination of contracts. Uh, it robs the judge's time for playing golf. How we think of it, but nonetheless, they don't like people terminating the contract, and they say, uh, if there's a t clause in the contract that enables you to terminate, they will enforce it, because the clients have agreed this, but they'll read it word for word and interpret it strictly. So you've got to dot your I's and cross the T's, because if you don't follow the process to the letter, then the shoot that swings around the other way. And if you've tried to terminate and didn't follow the clause, you have been deemed to have wrongfully terminate the contract, and then the other person can sue you for damages even though they did everything wrong, just because you didn't follow the process in the contract. So be very careful, and whenever it comes to terminating a contract, get advice. Uh, even if it's just initial advice, get some advice before you proceed down that, uh, that path. And hopefully, there may be a chance of salvaging a contract. Uh, one case that a client comes to me saying, oh, Steve, I've, you know, you know, this person hasn't paid me, I don't know what to do, I've been chasing them up, and the response was, well, how did the relationship go bad in the first place? And I did not got to understand the, the stresses that were on both people. And just got on the phone to the other person. The other person had a lawyer by this point. Got on the phone to the lawyer for the other side saying, can these guys talk it out? Because by this point, the parties weren't talking to each other. Can they talk it out? Can they try and get things back on track? This doesn't really need to go to court. And sure enough, the lawyer was like, happy with that? Fortunately, they weren't a very, you know, was actually a very good litigator, this, this lawyer, uh, but he took a very pragmatic approach, saying, uh, happy to make that recommendation to the client, his client agreed, and they started talking again. Left my office, and I haven't heard from them since. Hopefully, it's still going well. Uh, now, there's an example here. I would love to go through it, but I have a feeling that Roseanne's going to tell me we're really running out of time. So, uh, in essence, the reason I put this example here is because of the factual basis behind it. But when I did this exercise uh, with a group of lawyers, about 20, three got it right. The other 17 got it wrong. And this is a two very convoluted clauses in a contract. So in defense of the lawyers, they, this was a very smart group of people. Uh, in defense of the lawyers, it, it's a... Uh, they are very convoluted contracts or clauses, and these days there's a lot more emphasis on plain English drafting contracts. Uh, but in essence, uh, in the factual scenario, people kept getting applying it wrong, saying, oh no, you can terminate. And if we read the clause word for word, the emphasis of the example is uh, the person couldn't issue the notice that then enacted the termination rights. So it's where you've got to be really clear on that sort of thing. Uh, quite often we take the approach of, uh, we'll look at, you know, someone says, I want to terminate a contract. All right, are you sure you want to do this? This is what, you know, if they fight it, you push them into a corner, they're going to fight it, they're going to go to court, this is what's going to cost. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes, okay. All right, can't convince you. Uh, firstly, uh, I want a second opinion on this. This is my view on it. I am not like to think I'm smarter than the average bear, but we're going to go get a barrister, because the barrister is the one who has to fight this in court anyhow. So let's get a second opinion on this, because if two people can say, yes, you're in the right, the odds are you know, more in your favour. Uh, or at least you know, you know sometimes someone might, a second opinion might pick up something I haven't. Not normally the case, but you know, we're only human. Uh, now, this is an example where someone didn't live up to the end of the bargain, but there's no clause in the contract. So it was, again, involves land from the 70s. Uh, 
Perry was the purchaser of land, Cooling Data Investments was the seller of the land. April, 7th of April, they enter into an open contract. Open contract means there's no settlement back. The uh, purchaser had this condition though that he had to sell Lilypilly, which is another property he owned. And they, there was no date on that contract either, or no date on that condition. Three months goes past, and calling at us, it gets a bit frustrated, saying, what's going on here? So they issue a notice to complain. <coughs> quite, quite common property transactions where the other side's grabbing their bills. Another month goes past, and calling at us fed up, so they serve as a notice of termination, saying, we want out. You got, you're not doing anything, we have no idea what's going on. Another month goes past, so we're now five months after when they first entered into the contract, and Cooling Gatter goes to court seeking a declaration that the termination was effective. And the qu question for the court at this point is, what is the time period, a reasonable time period on an open contract? 10 months after they first entered into a contract, the purchaser finally says, uh, well, the sale of Lily Pilly was only for my benefit, so I have the, the right to waive that condition, and I waive it, uh, thinking that the contract was still in force. And then a few weeks later, uh, Perry, uh, Perry actually does enter into a contract to sell Lily Pilly and counterclaims against Cool and Gather for wrongful termination. This went to the High Court. Five very eminent judges looked at this and couldn't agree. Well, they, they formed some agreement. So, who thinks three months was a reasonable time period to terminate an open contract? Okay. Not what the judge has said, but. <laughs> <laughs> who thinks four months? Huh? No, no, no. And if you don't either, I will. Sorry. Four months. Who thinks four months? The motion here. Well, have any takers of four months? Going, going, gone. Any takers of five months? Is there any correspondence with Perry back during after they received notice? Oh, there's probably a whole, yeah, there was, uh, <coughs> the court only focused, well, the high court only focused on these ones. I actually haven't read the trial decision, but there would probably be a series of background emails at this point, uh, or back to the 70s, background faxes and phone calls. But, uh, three, of, three of the judges said five months is reasonable. Uh, And, but they weren't happy with this notice. So they said, uh, but they also said you didn't really need to issue a notice because it was a contingent condition and there was a few technicalities on it. But they said five months is a reasonable time period. Another judge said five months is a reasonable time period, but I'm not happy that they didn't issue a notice. And another judge says, you guys are all crazy. Five months is nowhere near enough time on an open contract. And so he actually found for parent saying you know, they are uh, calling out a wrongfully terminated. Now, fortunately, there was at least some consensus that the reasonable time period was somewhere in this four to five month period here. But it just goes to show when there's that much disagreement at a high court level, uh, it is really uncertain what you're meant to do when another party is not living up to their end of the bargain. And it's very frustrating for the person who wants the contract to keep continuing, saying, well, the other person is just not doing anything. How much longer do I have to wait? And the answer is just you have to be reasonable as much as possible. Give them every opportunity to try and resolve this. Now, if it means you're taking six months, I think after six months, any court's now going to say you're, you're off the hook. Uh, but, if it, but you just got to take into account all the circumstances here. Uh, it's not common that you'll have an open contract in the sale of property. Uh, this was a bit unusual in that case, but just something you have to bear in mind. Uh, risk mitigation for when a dispute occurs. So, does your contract have a security clause in it? Security clause isn't necessary for all contracts, but uh, PPSR is Personal Property Security Register. So you can, if you're supplying something on credit, you can <coughs> say, well, uh, I give him something to you, I've got 60 day payment terms. Uh, I want to be able to register an interest because you may not pay me and then my goods are just sitting out there and I have to somehow pay them back. Do you have a dispute resolution clause in there? Well, does the clause just talk about termination rights? 
you can have very long dispute resolution clauses that are very effective. Get the parties talking to each other again. A very good dispute resolution clause will say uh, the parties must first meet and try and talk things out for the first month. And then they must try and mediate uh, or arbitrate depending on the type of dispute. And then if after three months things can't work out, then you start getting going, uh, going up to court, unless there's some urgent need. Indemnities, two ways should they can work against you. So do you have protection for your legal costs? Do you have protection for a breach of contract? Indemnity means that you are not out of pocket at all. Uh, they can be very effective if you need to uh, seek some unusual losses uh, through a statutory demand, because without the indemnity, uh, you can't do it until you've got a court order. Someone is, uh, if someone, uh, if there's death or injury, uh, and then is it reciprocal? If you put an indemnity out there, sure, the other side's going to say, well, I want an indemnity back. Some of these things you can manage through insurance. So, or you can manage commercially anyhow. So, this is just rehashing the practical points that we've talked about. Get it in writing, subject to contract, subject to legal review. Think about whether you want this to be binding or not. Make it clear that it's binding. Don't take on a bad deal. Everything is negotiable. Read the clause strictly when you're terminating a contract uh, and get legal advice on it. And allow more time. Don't feel like you are pressured into something, even when you feel like, oh, I have to do this right now. The, it, the deal will just fall away if I don't buy this thing right, right now. Or if that's signed right now. Call your lawyer and the lawyer will hopefully say, do it 24 hours. Things will not, you know, sometimes you'll miss out on a deal if you wait 24 hours. That's not often. So uh, <coughs> that's our contact details. And I think that's it. Well, that's it. Well, that's it. Well, that's it. I know we've gone over time, but we've covered an enormous amount of ground. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, so a cooling off period is one of those legislative ex uh, uh, exemptions to a termination. So basically it says it's a special type of termination that says you can get out of the contract within seven days of signing, basically. So you know, or, or however long the period it is, sometimes it's three days. Uh, but for any reason whatsoever, uh, and it's designed to give people like in property sales uh, the chance to look at the property, uh, see things that may come up that didn't see on the open inspection. Uh, there's cooling off periods in franchising. You've got to be careful when the cooling off period starts because quite often it starts from when you sign the contract, and quite often you've signed the franchise agreement, uh, and I'll give you franchise in this case, uh, let's say on the, uh, from the 27th of August, but the business sale, especially if it's a new business, may not occur for several months. Your cooling off starts from today, not from when you get the business. So try and align it to as much as possible as well. And so it is a clause in, in a contract? It can be. It doesn't have to be, though. You have the protection there no matter what. I have a question um, about service. So uh, let's presume you know, I'm doing something in this building. I've uh, been here for four years, five years. I haven't signed anything. I'm continuing my job. You're paying me. What happens then? Obviously, you can pick up the phone and say, get lost. Or whatever. Okay. Correct or not? So, can you just repeat the quote? The, 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 the it's a service or in <coughs> business, mm -hmm. so it's in the building again, yep. doing something. Um, and I've been there four or five years. There's no contract. Just yep. verbal between me and you. I'll come in, I'll, I'll do something, or whatever you want me to do. Uh, I've been there four or five years, and you decide tomorrow, pick up the phone and say, I don't want you to go. Yep. I don't have a contract, we're going to say. Yep. But I'm, content, I'm doing it. So, where do we? Stand this goes back to one of those last slides I was, I was uh, talking about, right. uh, where there's nothing soft, there's nothing written about it, there's no, and it probably hasn't come up in discussion. Uh, you know, sometimes very <coughs> discussion about, oh, give me, you know, give me uh, a month's notice. But if there's no discussion on the point, and that's very rare that there will be discussion on that, uh, it's going to be what's a reasonable time for you. So if there's been a contract that's been going on for that long, there's going to be questions about. It's not a contract. Well, oh, sorry. Well, there's an agreement that's been going on for that long. Uh, there's going to be a question about uh, what's an understanding this would go on. Yeah, sometimes 
agreements start off like that and they morph into an annual basis. Uh, they may morph into just an ongoing monthly basis. Uh, it may be there's no, still no understanding as to how long this is meant to go for, no period of time. Uh, in which case, courts generally look at what's a reasonable period to terminate. So in leases, for example, uh, because this issue does come up quite often. Sure. Uh, there's no written lease. Someone's just been sitting there in a commercial tenancy for some time. And the law says, well, if there's no, or even if there is a written lease, but it's expired, what happens afterwards if there's no nothing in writing about a holding over period? So the law sort of puts in place a, a monthly holding over period, saying, well, we think 30 days is enough. Now, I have this question on a, like your question on, it was a written document, but there was nothing about the termination of this. There was nothing about the period. It just said, we engage you to, to, to do X, uh, and, everyone just, and this was the price. And somewhere along the way, after a few years, someone wanted to terminate. Oh, my client says, oh, we want out, we're negotiating something else now. Uh, and we had to think about what was a reasonable period here. Uh, was it you know, six months? The client wasn't really happy with that, so they took a gamble at three months. Saying we give 90 days notice, uh, but it's really, it's going to be you have to analyze. And unfortunately, this is going to be the display in a lot of these sort of questions. You have to analyze all the facts there. What was everyone's understanding? And sometimes it has more. Yeah, my argument is there's no contract, yeah. you know, then you're bounded because it's in a big building like this. You know, uh, obviously, work health and safety is an issue, yeah. Rather than actually, the question that everyone here has to have one. <coughs> so I'm sort of walking around through here, everyone. I'm unsigned, they're all signed, I'm not. Yep. So, you know, where does work of the safety from my end and contractual joining to make you responsible as a landlord or whatever you might be? Well, the work health and safety legislation, I think, will apply to uh, everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. will capture everyone to ensure that the, the worker is protected by no matter what, someone. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can use the contract to try and shift the liability, but otherwise the Act will say, no, the employee's protection is a number one priority, and I don't care if it's the building owner or the service provider or whoever, but someone is responsible. Everyone, actually, everyone's responsible. Mm -hmm. That's right. uh, all you can do under the contract is say, if, is seek the indemnity. So if you are the building owner, let's say, and you have a contract with a service provider, the building owner will quite often say, uh, if we are found, if someone gets injured and we are found to be uh, yeah. responsible, you are identifying us. Yeah. Because it's really it's your employee, you have our policy and yeah. Cool. In, in fact, John, I think you've got a good publication on your site exactly on that point of, on, on the industry called applying to uh, work safety. I'm not sure we had a look at 2014. It's uh, one which uh, draws the attention to the landlord as well as to the tenant. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. The, the Red Card Commercial Lease Guide. It's, yeah, it's yeah. on the website. Yeah, yeah. You can download the PDF. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Any on the web, Brazil? Thank you. Uh, if you, on a side point, I, I really have one question come in before the presentation today. If you do have any questions you know, after you know, sleeping on this tonight, please just shoot us an email. Uh, you can either email Roseanne and she'll forward it to us, or you can email us, email us direct. And we have it to yeah, try and answer your queries as best you can, or get on the phone to you and talk to you through your questions. So. Thank you, Stephen. That was very, very informative. If we could show our appreciation. And thank you for attending tonight. Thank you out on the webinar. Um, could you please complete the feedback forms? It <coughs> does help us uh, ensure that we're delivering what you need, and if we're not, uh, Please tell us as well because uh, that will shape our future direction. Uh, please like us on Facebook. Uh, that will keep you up to date in what we're doing. Uh, also on LinkedIn. And we are recording these events and they're going up on uh, YouTube. So you can go back and have another look if you need to. Uh, also in your bags, you'll find a flyer which has uh, got our next events coming up. Our BizLink session uh, on Wednesday the 12th is sold out, um, but you can join us obviously on the webinar, so we'd encourage that. Uh, retail and commercial leasing for small business, we've touched on some of those issues today. Uh, Thursday the 4th of October, here uh, on the 13th floor. Simple steps to safety, work health and safety, we'll pick up some of those issues on Wednesday the 24th of October. 
navigating disputes in the building and construction industry and what an interesting piece of territory that is. Uh, Thursday the 8th of November and franchising for small business, uh, Wednesday the 21st of November and all those events are here. Thanks again for attending. See you soon. Cheers. Thank you.